Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True, and it is a great joy to welcome you to our Walking Together page of resources. It's a collection of resources where Sounds True stands strong in solidarity with the Black community, where we are growing in awareness and accountability as a company and striving to put our love into action. Today's session is a very special session. It's with Trisha Hersey, who's known as the Nap Bishop. She's gonna be talking about rest and collective care as tools for liberation. Trisha Hersey is a remarkable person, a writer, performance artist, theologian, community organizer, and in 2016, she founded the NAP Ministry, which is an organization that explores the liberating power of napping. And you know, it can sound kind of simple, but actually the more that I've explored it, both in reading about Trisha and her work, and then also internally contemplating the power of rest and dreaming, uh, I'm amazed at how such a simple gateway can deliver such depth and transformation. And I'm excited for you to meet Trisha and hear more about this from her. Born and raised on the South side of Chicago, she holds a Bachelor of Science degree in public health from Eastern Illinois University and a Master of Divinity degree from Emory University, the Candler School of Theology. Okay, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Trisha Hersey, the Knapp Bishop, take it away. Thank you so much, Tammy. What a beautiful introduction. And I am so honored to be here. I am always honored when I have an opportunity to share my voice to this collective um, awakening that is happening when I can share my voice um, on all of the things that I have experimented with and um, navigated the world through. Um, and so I'm excited today to present um, this talk and have a um, brief chat with Tammy later. And so the talk today is rest and collective care as tools for liberation. And so I am very um, excited about the ways in which we can begin to uplift rest and the ways that we can begin to really shine a light on the systems that are making us unwell, on the systems that are um, making us exhausted and sleep deprived and burnt out on the systems that are disconnecting us from our bodies, from our from each other, from our interconnectedness, from our communities. And really uplifting these systems is key to our liberation, um, collectively looking at them together, healing our own individual trauma. So all of these things are part of this idea of rest as resistance of rest and collective care really being tools for um, our liberation and how we can uplift them. And so there's a photo here, the first slide of me laying down um, these fine art photography photos. I think part of our art practice and part of this liberation practice is also um, aesthetic and looking at images and uplifting the ideas of seeing black bodies at rest of seeing marginalized bodies at rest because this is a radical thought in a place in which like um Amer like the usa like the western world um that's anti-black where racism is rampant where white supremacy is um a part of our making it is so important that when we look at a black body um bodies that have been commodified um for centuries you know capitalism started started on slate on plantations um, all over the south so enslaved Africans um, being pushed to the limit um, being America's first experimentation how much a body can do how much how far you can push a human body into a machine level pace that same terror and energy that was created um, and experimented on on plantations, cotton plantations, tobacco, plantations all over the South and all over um, parts of the African diaspora. So it is so important that we begin to make these connections between what grind culture looks like today. Grind culture is simply a continuation of that energy. It's a collaboration between white supremacy and capitalism. It's this idea of um, 
bodies being used as a tool for evil, a tool for profit, of our bodies not being our own, of this machine level place. Capitalism wants our bodies to be a machine. And we know that we aren't machines. We're divine human beings. And so it's so important that a lot of our work is centered around images and putting up um, these beautiful um, images of uh, Black folks resting. This is an image of me resting. Um, cotton has been digitally put in at the bottom. It's a piece of work fine art photography done by a friend of mine named Charlie Watts. And there's cotton, I'm laying with cotton. So the name of this piece is Resting with the Ancestors. And it's um, a piece of, um, that we've been doing all over Atlanta. There's different iterations of me resting in the same dress all over on land, outdoors. And so it's so important that these images continue to begin to help us decolonize our mind around who rest is for, how rest has been, um, taken from many people, how who's allowed a space to rest? What does that look like in a culture like our own? And so that is a photo that I wanted to share. And so I want to begin this talk really talking about this idea of reimagining rest. You know, when you think about napping and resting and sleeping, people can't make this connection between what does any of that have to do with white supremacy and capitalism, two violent systems? What does that have to do with anything? And so it's important that we begin to uncover that and also begin to reimagine what rest can be like in our life. And I wanted to always share a story about my grandmother, Ora Caston. She's an ancestor now, but she is the muse of this work. And really the person who taught me the idea of what reimagining rest looks like, what snatching rest in a capitalist, um, white supremacist, patriarchal systems lo looks like, what it looks like to be subversive and inventive and very flexible and in, in tap into our imagination, to be able to create these alternative worlds and portals and temporary spaces for ourselves to gain rest and care and connection in a culture that does not want us to have that. And so my grandmother um, was a uh, refugee of Jim Crow terrorism, born in the deep south of Mississippi, and like millions of Black people during the Great Migration, this, hist this history um, that happened in our American culture, the Great Migration, millions and millions of Black people left the South, left the deep South, running from the KKK, running from um, Jim Crow terrorism, racial terror, and left in went to the North, went to the West, and it went in millions. It's the largest um, migration of people in our um, history and the culture of America. And so my grandmother was one of those trailblazers, one of those subversive believers and imaginer, a imag person who had a deep imagination to say what I'm existing in now is not it. And I'm going to move and go here. And so she landed she built this spaceship out of uncertainty and hope and landed in Chicago on the South Side. And I'm so grateful for her. She raised eight children. My mother was one of those eight children. I'm one of her dozens and dozens and dozens. There's so many, I probably don't even know um, grandchildren who were running in and out of her home in the summers, hanging out. She's the matriarch. Her home is never locked. Everyone's there, but every single day in between working her two jobs, running from poverty, healing from the trauma of um, being a refugee from um, Jim Crow terrorism. She sat on her couch with her eyes closed every single day and she rested her eyes. And I would always ask her, what is she doing? I thought she was so eccentric as a child. And she sat and I would always say, is grandma asleep? Are you sleeping every single time without even opening her eyes without missing a beat, she would say, every shut eye ain't sleep. I'm resting my eyes, I'm listening. How radical that is for her to be um, making space for herself, reclaiming her space when all of the world around her was attempting to crush her. Um, when she's dodging all of these things, this is like leaving from her home, having to have a new home in a place that she didn't know that she sat every single day in between her two jobs and just shut her eyes for 30 minutes. This meditation, this Zen, this portal, this daydreaming, this silence that she, this slowing down that she uplifted for herself. And that's really what we are gonna have to do in our systems now because the systems don't want us to rest. They're in collaboration for us all to continue to work 80 hours a week, work 
12 hour days, don't take time off, rush. White supremacy work culture is centered in this sense of urgency. Everything is urgent. All, everything is always urgent. There's no time to stop. That our worth is connected to how much we create and do. And we know that that's a lie because our worth is created simply by our birth, by us being alive, by us being here on earth, this divinity that um, has been stolen from us based on treating our bodies like a machine, this machine level pace. Sleep deprivation is a public health issue, a racial justice issue, and also a social justice issue. The science around sleep easily tells us that um, our culture is at high levels of sleep deprivation and it's affecting our health, our mental health, our physical health. And I believe that it's affecting our uh, ability, our spiritual health and our ability to connect with ourselves and with each other. And so I always wanna drop and say the tenets of the NAP ministry as this work is evolving and experiment and we're experimenting and we're grounding this work. It's so important that the tenets, that this work, you know that this work is rooted and grounded in deep radical political thought, is rooted and grounded in uh, spirituality and this connectedness and this idea of us pushing back, of reclaiming. And so the tenets are, Rest is a form of resistance because it disrupts and pushes back against capitalism and white supremacy. So it is an active form of resistance because it's disrupting this narrative of go, 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 or that our bodies are our own, that our worth has to be created by how much we finish on our to-do list. It's pushing back against the ideals that capitalism is built on, that um, a, we don't own our own bodies, that bodies can be pushed to the limit of a machine level pace. It's rooted in the same um, energy and terror of um, chattel slavery in America is rooted in the energy and um, power of um, deep, deep disconnection with our bodies and with um, the divinity of human beings. The second one is our bodies are a site of liberation. And I truly believe that wherever our bodies are, we can find rest. The time to rest is now. We don't need no fancy mattress. We don't need like extra time to go take a retreat off away from our home. We don't need um, anything extra. Our bodies itself are the sacred space that holds this site for liberation for ourselves. So the more that we can connect with our bodies, the more that we can stop disconnect, because you're disconnecting with your body when you know you're sleepy, when you know you're tired, when you need to rest, but you push through it. You um, all-nighters. Um, capitalism makes it so that some people, many people in this culture are working three, four jobs and still can't make a living, still can't pay rent. Um, capitalism wants to pay us the least and work us the most. It would love for us to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, never stopping. And they'll replace our bodies with someone else once that we're done. And so this idea of automation, this idea of not listening, of being urgent, of disconnecting with your bodies so that you can become a machine, so that you can be automated and disrupted in a way that doesn't look at your body as a whole, divine place of liberation that's worthy of care. Rest is a human right. It is a divine right. It is not a privilege. It is not a luxury. Um, we also believe that NAPS provide a healing portal to imagine, invent, and heal. So this portal, this idea of NAPS being this third space, this of sleeping, of resting, of slowing down, of silence, being this place that we can go and work things out. This is the spiritual and the somatic dimensions of this work, of, of resting, being this place for us to go and um, receive a word from, from God, like my grandmother, re listen, to re receive a word and a download from our ancestors, to connect in, um, to the body technology that we have, to invent, to come up with new ideas, to heal, um, a place to go um, and work things out that you can't work out when you're in this conscious realm. And so to believe and have a different idea and change your perspective around what naps and really are really are of this portal for healing is really powerful and then the last one is our dream space this idea of a dream space has been stolen and we want it back and we will reclaim it via rest so the dream space is i believe the place where we can go to create this new world centered in liberation that we all want um, that we can go and 
create a new place, imagine a new world. Another world is possible. You know, the world that we live in right now was dreamed up and crafted and purposely created in, to be the way it is. White supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy, all of the oppressions and the traumas that are making it so that everyone isn't treated as a divine human being. We're all created and they all can be torn down and we can imagine a new way. But our imagination and our inventive ideas and this idea of restoring will not come to us from a, a exhausted state. We won't come to it from a sleep deprived state. And so that's why I believe rest is so important. It is, it's a deep um, foundation for us to begin to slowly unravel from our brainwashing, from this idea that um, we aren't enough, that we have to do more. It also is slowly dismantling us from the I, this nuanced idea of um, this interconnected ability between all of us, the collective care. No one is free until we're all free. And so if a black woman or a black person can't rest in this culture because of anti-racism and white supremacy and capitalism, then even um, if you aren't um, don't have black skin, then that also means that you can't be free. This deep interconnectedness, this idea of no one is free until we're all free, this idea rooted in womanism, in black liberation theology, in justice, in reparations theory, in spiritual care. And so this idea is really grounded in the following, resting and sleeping and naps being a form of resistance and reparation is grounded in some of these um, things all of these things actually, black liberation theology, womanism, racial justice, social justice, Afrofuturism and imagination. These are all um, things that I deeply have studied that I deeply go to that have helped me to navigate this world that come to me from a lineage of, um, of black liberation that comes to me from a lineage of um, being raised at, um, by a community organizer and activist and preacher. Like, so this is like a collaboration of all of my life of being raised in these ways and, and searching and researching and experimenting. This is an embodied practice. It's not about reading a lot of theory. It's, theory is there, but there needs to be theory and practice. Praxis has to come together so that we begin to take these ideas and begin to slowly embody them and slowly see resting as this meticulous love practice. We have to do it. We have to rest. We have to stop being urgent. We have to slow down. We have to um, deprogram and detox from our toxic work culture. We have to do this deep, deep individual healing around the idea of saying no, or whatever terror and trauma that we were born into, that we experienced growing up. Those are things we have to slowly heal and uncover from in a holistic way. So community care, spiritual care, somatics, sleep science and public health, reparations theory and, and deep, deep history, deep American history and just history of the ways that we have um, been and behaved and enacted in this culture, like really uplifting that so that we can be in to, to heal from it. And so I think um, not many people may um, have heard of womanism. You know, womanism is um, a perspective that came out of the, um, feminism, forgetting Black women's voices, feminism, not um, looking at the ways in which all women are in a part of this justice movement, feminism actually being deeply rooted in white supremacy from the beginning. And so women, um, there are many women, Alice Walker first wrote about womanism, but there's a womanism and then there's womanist theology and I study both. Um, they were like some of my main um, research interests in graduate school. And so I love to pull up this idea of womanism because I believe understanding this and being um, engaged with this and just being aware of it really helps you to see this idea of this interconnected nature, this collective care, how we must care for each other that Collective care will save us. It has saved us. I'm alive today because of collective care, you know, because of the ways in which my ancestors cared for me and cared for each other and saw radical deep care as a pushback, 
as a counter narrative to the violence that um, we live in. And so womanism is a social change perspective rooted in black women's everyday experiences and everyday methods of problem solving in everyday spaces. So this everydayness, I love this idea of just, just everyday methods, everyday experiences um, of problem solving in everyday spaces extended to the problem of ending all forms of oppression for all people. Restoring the balance between people and the environment slash nature and reconciling human life with the spiritual dimension. And this is a um, definition by Layla Phillips um, from a book called The Womanist Reader and her article in it is called Womanism on Its Own. And it's, it's just beautiful, really grounded idea. Um, and I really believe that understanding womanism will help someone enter in to the work of the NAP ministry and help them enter into this idea of this work and this energy came out of a black liberation lens, but I believe and woman is, woman, woman is believe that black liberation is a global bomb for all of humanity. Until black people are free, no one is free. Until all forms of oppression for all people is ended, we won't be able to restore this balance between people and nature and reconcile human life and spirituality. So Martin Luther King um, is a quote where he says, no one is free until we're all free. And he talks deeply in a lot of his sermons. He's um, a deep inspiration for me about interconnectedness, about our deep intimate tie to each other about this um, way that we're so deeply rooted within each other that we are ignoring that because we've been trained by white supremacy to see a binary, to see it's either or, to see black, white. Yes, these ideas are very important, but when it comes to healing our entire culture, a culture in which all of us have, have experienced white supremacy and capitalism, um, either you've been aligned with it and you've enacted it, it's part of your ancestral history, your family, um, you've been um, a person who's um, experienced it. You've um, aligned with it. White supremacy has robbed us all of our ability to see divinity in each other and in ourselves. And so it is a problem for all people to end, not just Black people. It is a problem for all people to restore this balance between people and nature and to reconcile human life with the spiritual dimension that it makes of it. And so this is one of my favorite quotes. And I think knowing and, and deepening into the concept of womanism and looking it up and reading it and really embodying this message of, um, of deep, deep care, deep, deep radical community care and how we have to make space for others to rest as, far, as well as resting for ourselves. So yeah, white supremacy and capitalism has brainwashed us all in very unique ways. And so within this reality, I believe, the NAP ministry believes that sleeping and resting and daydreaming and leisure become this third space, this portal for healing. We can reclaim that dream space stolen from us by capitalism and white supremacy. Rest disrupts and it pushes back. It makes space for invention. Like, it connects us. It's this portal for deep healing. And it will take enormous effort in the form of radical healing, change, redemption, and collective care. It will not be easy. We're talking about um, dismantling and unraveling and decolonizing from very deep, deeply rooted violent systems. Um, it will be a lifelong unraveling. This meticulous love practice that begins with healing our ancestral individual and collective traumas. And so we all have this unique ancestry. We all have this unique history and family story and origin story of where we landed within these, these systems. And, you know, each of us will has to take that deep time to unravel from the trauma of that, you know, from the terror of, of those things. And to see that we all are being, um, deeply, deeply brainwashed in very unique ways. So also the individual trauma, our collective traumas. This is where that work comes in. This is where this is about more than naps. It's about a deep perspective around justice, around connecting with our bodies, around connecting with spirit and energy. I believe that um, white supremacy and capitalism is 
killing and harming everyone on the planet, including the planet. And so the planet is also suffering because of it. And so this grind culture, this collaboration between white supremacy and capitalism that has us going, 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 that has us not even ever allowing the earth to rest. We don't, we don't rest. We don't have time to have silence. We don't um, listen. We don't, we just go, go, go quick, 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 because we're always trying to reach the next level, not understanding that the work really is in the slowing down. The um, ideas and the invention and the healing is in the slowing down. And so we align with these systems. We align with these toxic systems via our refusal to make space for ourselves and others to rest and connect. And so the more that we align with Brian culture, the more that we rush, the more that we are urgent, always urgent about everything, the more that we are steady, always on our phones, never detoxing from technology, always in a mode of I have to be doing something, um, never taking time off, burning out, um, being um, unkind to ourselves and unkind to each other. These are the things that we have to align, uh, um, dismantle from and begin to make space for ourselves to rest and connect. This is about connection, about deepening into our bodies, about deepening into our listening of what has really happened. We are the portals. And so rest is our foundation in that way. One of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite womanist theologians, M. Sean Copeland, from her book, In Fleshing Freedom, Body, Race, and Being. And I believe if um, you leave with anything today, um, that you leave in with this idea of really deepening into this, that you write this down in your journal, that you sit with it, that you nap with it, that you meditate on this idea, this question, this inquiry. How do we care for our own bodies as sacred? And how do we cooperate to craft a world in which all bodies can thrive? I think that's so important. And then finally, um, this new world that we're looking for, this new world that we want to create, that we that centers liberation and rest, it must be our foundation to invent, restore, imagine, and build. I keep hearing about this new world and there's these veils that are being lifted right now in our culture, specifically um, speaking about the entire year, last year with COVID, with the uprisings for Black Lives, with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, with the insurrection at the Capitol, with the um, new election, with white supremacy being revealed in so many places, there's been this um, awareness for some, a new awareness for many, around these ideas and we are all, many people are speaking about these ideas of uplifting this new world. We gotta create a new world. This isn't normal. Um, terrorism from the police isn't normal. This shouldn't be happening. What can we do? And so I want to uplift the idea that exhaustion will not save us in coming to these ideas from an exhausted, sleep, de sleep deprived, disconnected place will just get us more of the same. Audre Lorde has a beautiful quote where she says, we will never dismantle the master's house by using the master's tools. So these tools that we learned about pushing bodies to the brink of exhaustion, to looking at a body as a human machine, to using bodies for evil, for um, for this capitalist idea of profit over people, all these things that we've learned from the systems that we've lived under, we've been socialized, we've learned that we've trained under white supremacy and capitalism our whole lives. And so we have to unravel from that curriculum and we have to begin to make new curriculum and, um, and really um, start to see it as a brainwash and see it as deprogramming our minds and decolonizing. While we're doing that, we must always understand that exhaustion will not save us, that we won't get there from that place and that rest is our resistance. Rest will allow us to be able to um, disrupt and make space. And so I'm very excited about um, this movement, excited about the ways in which people are saying no and pushing back against exhaustion, the ways that people are creating new spaces for listening and connecting. And so I would love now to um, talk with Tammy and do a little chat and to see um, thoughts and to deepen more into the conversation. Wonderful, thank you so much, Tricia, thank you. 
to begin with, I'd love to know a little bit more from your perspective in your own life. How do you rest? Mm-hmm. Do you put it in your calendar? I'm going to take a nap Absolutely. every day. Yeah. Is it a calendar Absolutely. thing? Or are you just like fall on the couch whenever you feel you need to and that's that? Or how do you do it? I do a little bit of both, but I do have a deep rest practice. So I do um, have a rest practice that looks like an hour every day. So that is placed in my calendar. Pre-COVID, it was pretty... Um, strict in my account. It was pr- anytime between the hours of 12 to three, because I had, you know, I was moving every day, doing events outside of the home. So it was like, um, now that we're working from home, um, I can be a little bit more um, flexible just because my all home office is next door to my bedroom. <laughs> so there's always opportunities for me to get it in when things aren't happening on my schedule, but I do book it in my calendar. It is an hour, um, every single day. I, and I also sleep. I have a really deep um, nighttime sleep schedule. I go to bed at a certain time. I probably get around nine hours of sleep a night. I also have very strict boundaries around my calendar and my timing and how people can book time with me in my calendar. So there's these healthy boundaries that I've created around only doing two meetings per day. All my meetings um, have to have an hour between them. Um, only 30 minute calls, you know, with Zoom fatigue being a reality, I um, don't have the camera on um, when I'm doing my first call with someone via Zoom. I limit a lot of um, my Zoom calls and kind of just do like traditional old school phone calls. I really love those. Um, I also daydream a lot, like that hour of resting is not always a nap. It may be a nap on the couch. It may be daydreaming outside of a window. It may be bird watching. It may be, you know, a longer time for meditation. And so there's all these different ways that I'm bringing rest together. And so it looks like a nap sometimes. Sometimes it looks like meditation. It looks like my grandmother sitting on a couch for 30 minutes every day with her eyes closed, listening, resting her eyes. And so they, it is in my calendar. You have to craft a rest practice and make space for it. This coach will not give it to you. You're going to have to snatch it, be subversive, be very intentional and see this as this love practice that is ongoing and lifelong. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, it's, it's interesting, this notion of putting the two words together, rest and practice, rest mm-hmm. practice. You know, it sounds true, of course, we've been offering people all kinds of teaching programs on meditation and chanting, all kinds of things. But but the idea that resting itself is a practice, all these other forms, you know, meditation, I'm saying my mantra, I'm focusing my mind, they take effort, they take effort. And even if I go to a yoga class, it's only the last 10 minutes where I get to lie down and daydream and space out. Yeah, I think that's just a really important idea for you to emphasize even more, how is this a spiritual practice? Yes, absolutely. Rest is definitely a spiritual practice. It is spiritual liberation. I believe that like prayer, like silence, like meditation, um, resting removes veils. And I think part of our idea around spirituality is the idea that there's always things happening around us, for us, behind the scenes. There's always this other realm and this other life that is happening that we can't see with our human eyes. This deep, deep knowing um, and intuitive knowing of there's something that's deeper than this. There's a connection to a higher power, a higher world. And I think when you rest and slow down and sleep and dream, that you are connecting with that that realm, that you are um, allowing the idea that I don't have to do everything, that everything hasn't, doesn't have to be done by me because there's always something happening um, or behind the scenes for my benefit. It allows you to have the veils removed from your eyes to be able to see what's really happening, to receive clarity like my grandmother to receive a word, she would say, I'm not resting my eye. I'm resting my eyes. I'm not sleeping. I'm listening to God. I'm listening to what God wants to tell me. I'm listening to the universe. So this deep connection, this idea of receiving downloads and waiting in silence and waiting in prayer and waiting in rest and waiting in sleep 
to connect to that. And so think about when we don't rest, when we're constantly on the go, when we're working, 10, 10, we have 10 meetings today, we work three jobs, we are fast, 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 urgent, urgent, urgent. There's even not even a moment for us to eat sometimes. We have these busy days. If you're continuously living like that, and that's the machine level pace of this culture, there's never a moment to tap in. And so I believe it's a spiritual practice because it's allowing you to tap in to your sacred body. It's allowing you to tap in to higher dimensions. It's allowing you to really understand and hear and see what's really happening. It's almost like it removes these, um, the veils, it removes the blinds over our eyes and lets us to really deepen into what we already know, what this deep intuitive knowing is that we all have because we all have a sacred body. Mm -hmm. Now, I I don't wanna make this uh unnecessarily complicated or uh-huh. now Tammy in order for Tammy to rest or other people I have to make sure I'm doing something but I am curious about this <laughs> which is is there a, like a prayer or a question oh, or even a kind of sacred intention yeah. I might bring to rest uh-huh. that would make it more of a meaningful experience than just kind of throwing a pillow over my head and yeah. collapsing Yeah, I love rest meditations and rest affirmations. And I love the idea of mantras and repeating things. What's become the mantra and like the battle cry, I believe, for the NAP ministry as a whole, like you'll see it on a lot of our work. You always say it on all of when I'm speaking is we will rest and you are enough and I deserve rest and I'm worthy of rest. I don't have to earn rest. And so this idea of not have, thinking we need to earn rest, this is the deprogramming and this, this meticulous um, unraveling that we have to do. Many people feel so much guilt and shame around resting. They feel like it's a waste of time. They feel like they could be doing something when they're resting. And so this idea of understanding and maybe speaking over yourself while you're sleeping, you know, reading a poem before you go to sleep because I love poetry for the language it's another language like I believe resting is another language and so I love this idea of a mantra of um we will rest of I am enough of I don't just I don't have to earn rest I'm worthy of rest and just beginning to slowly um heal from the trauma of believing that your worth is connected to how much you do. That's deep trauma. That's deep violence. Um, Grind culture is violence. It's violence to look at a human divine body and say, oh, you exist. Thank you for being here on earth. But to be able to prove that you're enough, you got to go and work 80 hours this week. You got to do something. I need to see something. Show me something. You know, go. Where is your proof? And so I think when we can begin to slowly see our bodies as sacred and to begin to deepen into the sacredness of it that's um a deep place to begin to like deepen into the rest practice this mantra we will rest you are enough beautiful now i wanted to ask you about these collective rest experiences Mm -hmm. that you've produced through the nap ministry and i'm curious what happens what goes on at a at a group nap yeah, they're beautiful. There's, those are, that's the entire signature program of the work. The work started there. It started with me resting and then personally experimenting with rest as an exhausted Black woman in America. And from that experimentation, being a community organizer, having a background as an activist and wanting to bring this to more, knowing that we all are exhausted. And so our first event in our signature program that we've done all over the country is a collective napping experience. And what we do is we go into any space and we've curated it in spaces from um, church basements to outdoors and parks, yoga studios. Um, It's so important to know that these are curated um, based on where we are being placed. So we've had some as small as three people sleeping in the basement of a church. Some of our larger one is up to 60 um, people resting together in a gymnasium. And so we go in um, and curate with yoga mats and pillows and blanket. We always build a beautiful rest altar that has water on it, all the elements of an altar, photos of my grandmother, or photos of my other grandmama, Dorothy, and these images of people resting and um, to really ground the space. And that this is a spiritual practice and we're about to enter into a portal 
if resting is a portal and a place that we can go into a third space, another dimension, then we make space for that. So we always have healing teas there, herbal teas that are crafted by one of um, my friends who's a tea herbalist. Um, that we have sound. So there's um, either live music being played or um, a curated soundtrack of music. We're really known for our sound curation, our music that is made specifically for people to rest. I am there as the Nat Bishop, like guiding the space, presiding over the space. And so people come in, their phones are um, turned off and put away. They get tea. There's They're given blankets and yoga mats and pillows. And there's lavender being sprayed. And so it it's a, becomes a full, almost like public worship in a way. It's like what I would have done when I was studying in divinity school, this deconstructed idea of public worship and bringing it into like a community sacred, um, you know, space that's for all, no matter what. And so I read poetry over the people while they're sleeping. It is a timed um, event. And so from it's 30 minutes to 40 minutes is the sleep time. And so I'm watching the room. I'm the only person up. I'm watching the room to see who's sleeping, who might need more support and just holding space for people to rest together. Um, music is playing. Um, I take people into the experience by reading an original poem. And then when it's time for them to come out of the experience, um, there are cues with lighting and sound for them to begin to wake up and come back into the portal slowly. Um, more poetry is read and then we hold a, a nap talk at the end where people can share their discoveries and talk about any curiosity ask questions and this is like such a beautiful moment for people most of the time they don't know each other at all but there's been moments where people have shared they've had the same dream that the other person has had and they don't even know the person like there's this syncing up that is happening when people are in a sleep state together in this sacred place together people wake up in tears saying they didn't know how exhausted they were that this is the best sleep they had so to see the embodiment of what's happening to a body at rest, I believe that's just a sacred moment. Um, I believe it's such a vulnerable, sacred place when people are in a sleep state. And so to hold space to, um, for that, to me, to be the person who's presiding over and making sure the space is very sacred and that everyone is held. And then for people to wake up and be holding space for each other. And so um, it's a beautiful um intense, inspiring play moment. The first one we ever did um, in Atlanta, um, 40 people came and they slept for two hours. It usually is 45 minutes, but I could not wake people. They were out. It was people I didn't even know. They were like, I heard about this in the newspaper. Is this where I lay down? And they were taking off their shoes before they even spoke to me and was like, where is the pillow? And I'm like, all right. They were so ready to sleep and, and lay down. And so they rushed to a blanket and a pillow. And um, we spent a lot of time. I have a crew of volunteers who help in labor to bring in all of this. A lot of um, things that have to be brought in. It's a few, full site installation. So it's beautiful work. Flowers are there. It's just creating a public space and a, um, a, a moment for people to embody this message. And it's so important that it happens. You know, Trisha, I notice when you talk about this collective experience, uh, I feel emotional. Uh, mm -hmm. It brings up a lot of emotion for me. Mm -hmm. And I think it just touches me to imagine mm -hmm. uh, all of us exhausted humans having that sacred experience together. Yeah. And I think that there is also this emergence uh, in, a, in an environment like that of our shared grief. Mm, yes. Our shared grief of the, uh, the, the space that we all live in, that we're all subject to. And I wonder if you can speak to that and how that grief might get moved through to a certain degree yeah. experiences like this. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm big. I love talking about grief. I'm big on uplifting grief. I really believe that rest makes space for grief and grief makes space for rest. And I believe that they're so intertwined. I, I've talked about this idea of really soaking in the fact that we've been bamboozled and brainwashed and the shenanigans of white supremacy and really coming to the understanding that we've been manipulated by this culture to think about resting and sleeping, something so sacred, something so natural and divine to our bodies as something that is an extra luxury priv privilege. Like that, that is like, think about how 
deep and, and, and toxic that is, like how violent it is to see someone, a human body, and to say, keep going. When you think about what was happening on plantations, like the deep, deep 20 hours a day working, the way we're pushing human bodies, starting as children to go, to stay up, to do this, to, to connect how much we are with what we do. Like what a deep scam and what a, a deep, deep um, manipulation. And so it is going to be some grief to like take that in that this has happened but then there's the larger collective grief of what has just happened in our world from living as humans here and so I believe that we aren't resting at all I believe that we're at this sleep deprivation status and I think that's totally combined and connected to how we also as a nation don't know how to grieve you know other cultures know how to deeply grieve they have some type of strategy around it <laughs> you know I'm think, thinking about African culture I'm thinking about my own black culture there, there, there's some type of strategy around resting I means grieving and um slowing down and honoring that here in our culture it's this go on, move on, you know, just, just, it's, everything is normal. Let's get back to normal that happened and let's go. And so to think of the grief that we're all under collectively with losing half a million people to COVID-19 and the grief of seeing our culture explode based on racial, um, in, racial injustices and all of the social injustices, I think that part of our healing is going to be in slowing down and part of our grief work is in resting, um, is in taking that moment for silence is in listening there. I believe that our body is this beautiful sacred technology that is this site of liberation for us and everything we need is housed here. Without the systems around us making it um, toxic and tragic for us to live, we would be well, you know, without these systems pushing on us constantly and um, brainwashing us and making us believe things that aren't true, we will be well. So left to its own device, our bodies know how to grieve, know how to rest, know how to stop. And I think about the idea of grieving and resting being so connected. It makes me think of the story of my dad. Um, he died suddenly 14 years ago. And suddenly, him and my mom were together for 40 years. And the um, he was really well known in the community, community organized, pastor of a, a church, you know, knew everyone in the community. And so it was tons of people in and out of our home, people calling and just people wanting to come pay their respects. And my mother, who was married to him since she was 18 years old, lost her partner and she just was beyond herself as she would be. The funeral director, who was a friend of my family's church, came to the house to set up the arrangements. And he's so nice to come because most of the time you have to go to him, but he knew what we were dealing with. He was like, I'll come to your home and we'll sit at the table and we'll make the plans for your father's services. And before he left, he just looked at my mom and looked at me and my sister, my brother, but he looked right at my mom. He said, are you resting? Are you sleeping? She was like, I can't not sleep. He was like, I, I'm, I've been, you know, burying people for 40 years. And I'm telling you right now, you have to find moments to rest, even if it's for 10 minutes, sleep, 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 you know, have some of the people who are wanting to come over and pay the respects, have a schedule when that can happen, because you're not going to make it through your grief if you're not if you're sleep deprived, if you're not resting, if you're not slowing down, if you're not catching at least a moment of sleep. And so I just remember him saying that in such a wonderful, loving way, you know, to uplift and tell her these tips on how that she could rest and saying to her that she won't make it on her grief journey. You know, he knew it was a journey and a pilgrimage. She's still grieving, you know, 14 years later, that she wouldn't make it if she didn't find a nap, if she didn't fine 10 minutes you know she was like I can't I'm up all night he was like I know you are um but you have to make it literally your job for this next week before we bury him that you continuously find moments to close your eyes to nap and so I, I, I saw my mother shift in that way and I saw her you know change and I began to see her finding these moments to, to sleep and us around the house finding, telling people they had to go right now and like making sure my mother went and laid down and just how the community came together for her to rest. And I'm him saying that you won't make it through your grief without sleeping. I think that's where we are right now. We aren't making it. <laughs> we are making it, but we aren't totally connected to the beauty of what our divine bodies and beings hold. 
And I believe that part of that is that we aren't, we don't know how to grieve and we don't know how to rest. So them together is creating this um, really crisis mode in our sleep deprivation and in our ways that we um, connect and know each other. And so, yeah, I think that that's what I'll say about grief and rest. Mm -hmm. All right, Trisha, I just have a couple more questions for you. This one's kind of edgy for me personally. As somebody who uh, runs a, a company, a for-profit company with a nonprofit uh, sister division, but a for-profit business, 150 employees, very committed to being a productive, profitable business, no margin, no mission, at the same time, very committed to the well-being of our work staff and having work-life balance. And I'm curious what you would say to organizations mm -hmm. that don't wanna be part of the grind, but mm -hmm. at the same time of uh, no margin, no mission, our, yep. our need, to, need to create mm -hmm. profits for our authors. And so how do you, what can organizations do yeah. in yeah. the spirit of collective rest? That's so good you asked that because I work with organizations a lot. I did a huge training in Illinois for 400 not-for-profit leaders in the state. And we talked about this very thing. And I really uplift the idea of creating systems of care. Systems of care, flexible systems of care, um, intentional systems of care that are a part of the framework for the work. So that could look like... Um, being very intentional about asking employees what is needed for what they need as human beings. You know, I'm thinking about working at corporations that were abusive and overworked me. And then it will be one day, they'll be like, we're going to have a pizza party and have a yoga day. And then that was the end of it. But then they went back to being the abusive corporation that wouldn't get to let you have time off when something was happening that worked you, um, that didn't, you know, find systems in place so that you weren't overworked, that um, looked at really the care of the employees as being central to the um, success of the organization. I don't think that the organization is going to be able to get to this profit, you know, to get to these, to get to the place they want to get to coming from a place of, you um, burning out their employees, of not looking at their employees as human, unique individuals, of not creating um, strategic systems of care as a part of the work, um, of not just being reactive, you know, of looking at white supremacy work culture, like looking at the characteristics of that and then doing the opposite. And so this idea of white supremacy work culture has been written about since um, early 2000s. There's a um, beautiful article that um, if you Google white supremacy work culture, it'll come up um, showing up for racial justice is on their website. And it talks about these different characteristics of white supremacy work culture and how it invades the spaces of people working in corporations and not-for-profits. Um, it looks like um, really not looking at human beings as human beings, it's just looking at profit over people. And I don't think that um, corporations can really succeed that way. I think that, yeah, they can succeed by making lots of money, but are they really succeeding when it comes down to the people who work for them, asking questions to them, being flexible about work times? I, I never understood why places I've worked in the past, not-for-profits were, were running their, their um, organizations like abusive corporations when they were a not-for-profit with a mission <laughs> to help the community but the people who are working there who live in the community are being harmed by the work that they do and so it just looking at things from a place of how do I do no harm how do I uplift um, the voices of the people who we have brought on to share this mission with us um, how do we look more at um, very inventive and um, ethical ways of doing business, work schedules, work times, how much people are paid, how much is on people's workload, things like that, just like base level uh, human ethics and base level um, human rights, I really think are really important. All right, and here's my uh, final thing I'd like to talk more about, which is okay. you mentioned this dreamscape, the dreamscape, mm. this place that we can enter through this portal of rest. and. Uh, quite honestly, what, what happened for me, uh, it was the middle of the night, I wasn't sleeping, so I decided to start reading about you and your work and reading some interviews with you, and I'm just going to share vulnerably here, and 
it was like I then I rested, you know, I read a little bit, digested in the middle of the night, and then yeah. I rested. And I went, I was like, I met you in a dreamscape wow. for this interview. And we had, a great, we had a great time together. And it was this <laughs> sense of our our connection and everything. I thought, huh, this is so interesting. Okay. Just, just touching the nap ministry a little bit. Mm. And I went into this imaginal world uh, that, and, and so I wanted to understand more how you see that. Like, do you have a model mm -hmm. that explains this dreamscape where we go and the possibilities it. for, uh, this is what I want to understand more, your view of that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, this idea of dreaming and what is happening in our dreams and what, you know, a lot of indigenous cultures believe dreaming in the dream space to be like another world, you know, that it's just as important as the world that the conscious world. And so when I talk about this portal and this dream space, um, I really believe that that is a moment of deep spiritual connection. Actually, when I started resting and started this organization and began to like experiment with resting, um, I began to like the ideas for this ministry and for a lot of the work that we're doing came to me in dreams, came to me. I was having these dream moments with my grandmother and with um, my ancestors and we were resting together and they were like walking behind me and like, pushing me forward and this I felt like this deep energy that I was actually um connecting with my ancestors and I believe that dreaming and dreams our dream space allows for that and so you know dreaming has been studied for centuries and we don't every you know you wake up and you have this beautiful dream and then it's like this interpretation of it and no one really knows exactly what it means but these idea of symbols and the idea of of dreaming and resting being a portal for that healing when you look at sleep science now it can be explained you know spiritually I don't think it can be deeply all the way explained I think it's a mystery Mystery. That's a beautiful mystery that I love. But I think when you add in some of the science that neuroscientists have studied around what's happening when we sleep um, and what is going on in our bodies, there are chemicals that are being released and our brain is taking a break. Our brain is being washed with chemicals that are allowing us to forget trauma. And there's a lot of things that are happening in our organs and um, a lot of um, spiritual connected things that are happening with our neurons. And so when you bring in the spirituality of sleep and the science of sleep, I think um, it's just a really imaginative, exciting place to think of going into a portal. I love these ideas of a third space. And I'm really deep into Afrofuturism, which is a um, perspective that looks at um, Black people and African people existing in the future and beyond is really rich in science fiction. It's in rich in liberation and justice. Um, Afrofuturism, futurists would say that Black folks can imagine a world where everything has been worked out, that we want to create um, a temporary space of this joy and freedom and this idea that we're living in the future now, that the future has already been worked out. Racism doesn't exist anymore. White supremacy has been eradicated. Capitalism never existed. So it's this deep, deep imaginative space. And I believe that um, we won't be able to imagine any new world without deepen into our imagination. I believe our imagination has been stolen by um, the oppressive cultures we live under. I believe we are sleep deprived as a public health issue. And because of that, we have no connection to imagination. And so I think the dream space that I love to uplift and that I love to um, have people go into in this portal is really a, a spiritually connected moment of your body and mind slowing down enough so that the beauty of, um, of, of our spirit world, the beauty of our brains and um, what our um, brains and neurons are working with can all come together and connect in a way that's deeply healing, deeply powerful and, um, and deeply um, slow. Trisha Hersey, I have to say, I've really, really loved talking with you. I love uh, behind you, there's a little sign that says naps help you wake up. Yes. Of course, great, you know, Sounds True's mission is waking up the world. And uh, now uh, by connecting with you uh, in the dreamscape and here now in this conversation for our walking together world of resources, uh, we're helping uh, people wake up uh, with rest. So thank you so, so much. I love, thank you so much for the opportunity. I've had such a great time speaking with you. It's been amazing. 
You are a terrific nap bishop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Sounds true. Waking up the world. Thanks for being with us. Bye-bye.